Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of The Theological Arsonist. Before we get into the episode, I want to introduce my sponsor, Emory House Coffee Company. Now, by the name, I'm sure you can guess, it is a coffee company, and man, do they make good coffee. And so, really quick, before the episode, I'm going to roll a brief little trailer that kind of gives you an inside look into what they're all about. And I just want to thank them for sponsoring this show, and I promise you, you will not be disappointed when you try this coffee. I have links down in the bio, um, or the description rather. Um, go click those, go buy this coffee, drink this coffee, and prove to be a Reformed Christian. Without further ado, roll the clip and enjoy this episode. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Theological Arsonist. I'm the host, Jonah Saller, and joining me today is my good friend, Hector. Brother, thank you so much for being with us today. I am so blessed to have you on the show. And we're going to be talking about a very, very, very important issue, uh, especially in today's evangelical culture. We're going to be talking about liberalism and how it's infiltrated the church, and ultimately why creeds, confessions, are so important to maintaining Orthodox uh, Christianity um, in these ever-changing times. Um, so before I introduce Hector and let him tell you a little bit about himself, I just want to remind people that if my ministry has helped you in any way, I have a Patreon page that you can find in the description below as well as on the YouTube banner. Um, and if you're listening to this, you can find a link uh, somewhere on the podcast page. So I really appreciate any support I can get. And if you become a Patreon, you have special benefits that are exclusive to you. So thank you very much for all who are listening, all who are supporting. And Hector, it's great to have you, brother. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, I live in uh, North Carolina, and my uh, main language is uh, Spanish. And uh, uh, I've been living here since 2008. And uh, I have a wonderful family, three girls, just had my third baby. And uh, it, it's been great. I have uh, my beautiful wife. We've been married for eight years. And we recently, and when I say recently, I'm probably talking about the last two years, we've been more informed about Reformed theology. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a backdrop, I was at a Wesleyan Armenian church. And during seminary, I realized I was a Calvinist. And this brought a whole, you know, uh, implication of uh, things that I had to go through uh, within the church. And then the more I grew in knowledge, the more problems I saw, uh, the more holes in the church I started to see. And um, that's when I made the decision to be a confessional uh, Presbyterian, just move to a Presbyterian Reformed church. Mm. And that's it. That's pretty much where I, what I'm doing right now. Awesome. <laughs> Well, like I said, we're going to be talking about the idea of liberalism and the slippery slope that that is in evangelical Christianity, and then reinforcing the importance of creeds and confessions within churches. Um, I don't attend a confessional church, but as I have grown um, in the Lord, I have seen a greater and greater value in confessional churches and really why they do what they do. For a long time, I was like, what's the point? And 
more I study it, the more I'm, it started to make a lot of sense. And so um, I just really want to hand it over to you, allow you to take us where sure. you want. And uh, yeah, floor is yours. Sure. My friend. Well, that's, uh, that's really interesting because I also grew up uh, outside of a confessional church. Um, I grew up in the Pentecostal charismatic environment. Mm. And then I moved to North Carolina, moved to the United States. And then from there, um, it's the same thing. You, uh, we pick churches because uh, we may be talking the same language or you know somebody, but we really don't put in consideration um, deep questions on when to go to the right church. Mm. And uh, I think our criteria is slow, it's weak, and sometimes uh, we put other things than sound doctrine in the way. Yeah. And I keep, I kept going to these churches because, you know, when people I knew were there or because, oh, my uncle is a pastor. And, and, and that started to create a problem because um, in a lot of these situations, there's not a lot of sound doctrine. And the one thing led to another, uh, kept going from Armenian, Armenian church to Armenian church, uh, and then I ended up at the Wesleyan Church. Mm. And then I noticed, you know, as I was growing into Reformed theology, I, I, I noticed that uh, they don't have confessions. And, um, and that's, what, that's something that really impacted me. Because once I understood what the confessions were, and I let all the stigmas to the side, and maybe um, all the bad thoughts that I had about, uh, you know, confessions and catechisms and you know, uh, which by the way, I have my, this is my daughter's first catechism. It's a oh, simple book. Awesome. Yeah. And it has simple questions of who is God. And, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful. It's, everybody needs to have a, a hold of these things because they are what protects the church. And yeah. we're talking about that right now. But um, essentially, um, in, I started, the more you grow in knowledge, the more you see what the evangelical church is doing today. And you may ask yourself one question, well, where, 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 what is the essential problem? What, what is the root of this? And in reality, that's really not the, the most important question. The question is, why are we being filtered in with these bad doctrines? And that's when confessions of faith and catechisms come really handy. Yeah. And the thing is that confessions of faith and catechisms grounds the church it, it, it tethers us to a deep biblical truth. And if we have a bad stigma, especially me. I had this idea that it was written by somebody. It's not the Bible. Well, I need to toss it out. Mm. And, 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 and that is anti-intellectual. And a lot of people go through this. You know, when they hear about confessions, uh, you know, they, they think of something repetitive. They may think of something uh, that is not the Bible, which is true. We're not substituting the Bible, and, and, and we're not saying that that has an equal authority as the Bible. Right. But it, it, it does ground us to essential truths that the Bible pro proclaims. Right. And, and not only does it ground us, Jonah, but it also protects us. Um, not only are we holding on to a uh, serious truth of the Christian faith, but we get protected by bad doctrines that try to you know, uh, infiltrate the church. And when a church doesn't have um, confessions or it's not aware of them, uh, I, I think that we let darts get in the church. Um, that's one of the things that happened in the previous church that I was in. Mm -hmm. um, they would, they, somebody would stand up and say something of some doctrine. Somebody would come the very next t uh, time and say completely the opposite of what that person said. So it, it would create confusion within the church. Right. And of course, one thing leads to another, and you can, if you don't have guidelines for what is acceptable or not within the church, you're just free falling into all kinds of doctrine. And that's what happened in the evangelical church. We just, we're dog, uh, we're dogs with fleas. We walk around and we just grab all these doctrines and we really don't know what we're doing. Right. And I, I, I think too, it's important to recognize that every single church is a confessional church. Technically, yes. Technically, right? Because yeah. Yeah. any church that claims any sort of doctrine is being confessional yeah. to a sense. And so mm -hmm. what we need to recognize is what sort of confessions are these churches? Exactly. To? 
Are they biblical? And if, yeah. like you said, we are not grounded in the confessions that have been throughout history and proven to be biblically grounded, mm -hmm. then anything goes. And that's exactly. the problem you have. And that's one of the, the things I've seen recently is when you go to, say, a non-denominational church or something like that, they have a statement of faith. And that statement yep. of faith is based on what they the leadership thinks is important, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And when you look at that, a lot of times it's not grounded in history. It's not grounded in all the mistakes that have happened that the church fathers yeah. were able to work through and respond to through these creeds and confessions. And yeah. so you end up making the same mistakes over and over and over again. And that's what, yeah. you know, is leading to what we're seeing, I think, today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and also, they make a similar mistake that the Roman Catholic Church did. And that is creating a monologue with itself. Um, when, you, when you start talking to yourself and making these confessions that are now founded in Scripture, um, you can also fall into a lot of problems. Um, it's, uh, it's also good to get a good uh, context of what the church is saying. And when I say that, I'm not talking about just uh, the contemporary church, but what about the church as a whole? Right. Oh, uh, and and then we do the we examine the exegesis of their day, what they've had go, to go through, what they had to protect, and then we apply it to us. And how could that be useful? And I I think that heresies don't go away; they just change uh, the structure in which they infiltrate the church. But essentially, it's the same doctrine. Right. Right. Yeah. I would I would completely agree with that. I think that. Uh, you know, to, to quote Ecclesiastes, there's nothing, there's nothing new under the sun, right? There's yeah. nothing new under the sun. And so everything yeah. that we see today is just a rehashing of something that was seen thousands of years ago. Yeah. Uh, and so, and again, I, I, I want to just briefly go back and just say that we need to recognize, because like you said, one of my concerns at first when I was thinking about confessions and stuff and kind of had this un- this idea that oh that's that's kind of weird traditional you know those those kind of yeah. people, they're, they're strange it's yeah. from this idea that that's not scripture right it's not scripture yeah. so why would i i do it but i think what we need to recognize is that any sort of teaching like i was just previously saying is rooted in something other than scripture right you're, you're yes. using scripture but then you're teaching and giving an interpretation of it and yes. so to throw the baby out with the bathwater and say you know, yeah. the confessions are useless because they're created by man. Yeah. Well, then at that point, you can't listen to anything. And yes. so it's not a matter of um, was it created by man? It's no. Is it based and founded in scripture? And can I look at scripture and back it up with scripture? Um, exactly. Exactly. And, and one of the things that I notice also is that uh, when we look at creeds and confessions, we need to think of it as a map. Yeah. Um, think about uh, going to a national park and you got, you may have mountains, you may have lakes, you may have, uh, you know, hazardous areas, which the, they won't want you to go. So they give you a map and the map essentially indicates that someone has been there before you and it's telling you where the danger lies. Right. Another way to look at um, confessions of faith is al almost like, a, you know, when you go ball bowling. And then they raise those little things from the side so the ball stays in the lane and doesn't fall uh, through it. And that's another example on, uh, or another illustration of how we should look at these confessions. They don't contradict the Bible. No. And they're not over scripture. Um, but they serve as a voice of what the church has had to encounter throughout history. And Luther would say about tradition uh, that there is a healthy tradition that we can follow. And that's something that a lot of people are afraid of uh, because they haven't really, um, you know, gotten a good hold of this stuff. But um, people think that um, traditions are bad. And technically, there is bad tradition, right? But there's tradition that is supported with scripture. Yeah. And um, this is a really good example of a healthy tradition uh, to hold the confessions. Right. And that's, again, why I think it's so important to talk about it is... It, it can become an unhealthy tradition if you don't know the why yep. behind it. If you're just mindlessly reciting these things because it's what yes. you do, uh -huh. then, then of course it, it doesn't matter in there. And then it's useless tradition. But if you're recognizing yep. the purpose behind it, it makes a huge yes, difference. And yes, so I, I kind of want to go into the idea of liberalism in the church. Cause I think yep. that that's one of the things we're seeing very prevalent, especially yep. here in the West 
Um, yeah. And I, I just want you to kind of talk about why you think that is. I know you said you kind of grew up in a liberal church. Yep. Um, I did myself as well. Um, I transitioned from different churches and the first one was Willow Creek Community Church, which is over in uh, Barrington, Illinois. It's a huge mega church and they've had a ton of issues. And the last time I attended there, it was basically a motivational speech, right? That's how, that's what the sermon had turned into. No yep. scripture, nothing, just a yep. go have a good week and come back next week for more pump you up stuff. Yep. And so a lot of churches, that's the direction they're going. Why are we there, Hector? <laughs> yep. Well, um, to, for, for what I've experienced, have seen, um, once I became reformed, I decided to linger there a little bit longer. Because, you know, there's a mentality of which as reformers, we have to reform, but there's a limit also on when we should leave the church. Yeah. Um, but with good guidance, I was under uh, a good Presbyterian reform pastor. He was guiding me and telling me that I should have led the church. Um, but while I was there, I noticed that there's a lot of stuff that are going on. And, you know, ironically, I went to their theological seminary. Mm. So I can tell you exactly what they teach. And um, there's a lot of wrong premises in their theology. Uh, first of all, um, they disregard Paul whatsoever. Because Paul, in his letters in Timothy, he establishes the structure of the church really clear. Mm. Um, he establishes what, who are the elders, who are the pastors. And if we just change the form of, of this description, we can change the way the church looks. And that's what they essentially do. Um, you know, um, in their theological seminary, I had the, the, the professor telling me that Paul was a sexist. So, so in other words, he's saying that Paul's sexist uh, behavior infiltrated the, the, the word of God. Therefore, the letters of Timothy were not, uh, mm. they were disregarded. And that, that blew my mind because I'm saying there's this go person saying that God's word is infallible. Yet he comes and says that the, the letters for Timothy are corrupted. Yeah. That blew my mind, especially for a Wesleyan person to say that, uh, which doesn't surprise me at all. But that was the way that they were heading themselves into. Yeah. And another thing that I've noticed is also uh, they think that there's a free will. Therefore, um, they think they can help God. I mean, this is their true intention, Jonah. They really think that they can help God uh, by his means. So they think of church growth as I am going to use all the strategies that work, whether they're secular, whether they're psychological, whether they're um, mater in a material way yeah. or, or in a visual aspect. I am going to help God grow this church. And that's what they essentially do. And, and they forget a simple principle. In Acts chapter 9, God, uh, well, Peter uh, heals a layman, right? And this story is really key because once he heals the layman, um, he lifts the burden on the layman, Jonah, but not only on the layman, but on those that were taking care of the layman. Mm. So, 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 so there's an organic way in which the church grows. Right. Um, and that is by ministering within the church. That is by uh, being loving to one another, right? Make our, inf our, our efficiency in love, but also preaching the gospel, yes. corporate worship, and taking the sacraments, you know, uh, for the believers. So this whole thing, right? The Bible says that God will add to the church those that are to be saved. Right. And, 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 and there's a different, see, there's two directions, essentially. Either we do it the biblical organic way and we stay a local faithful church or we lean to the uh, psychologists or we lean to the humanists and we, we make everything um, palatable. You know, we don't want to be controversial. So essentially, the, the checkmate in this problem is that they get rid of the gospel because yeah. if you don't give them the bad news, Jonah, there is no gospel. You've taken away from the gospel. Yes. I so, more. Yeah. 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 And, and, and another thing that they do, Jonah, is that they really don't believe in the gospel, some of these churches. Um, because they, they, if they did, they would really preach it. Right. Right. I, I completely agree. And I, I've experienced that myself in several of the churches that I was a part of, is it's the idea of we want the church to grow. 
And a lot of it has to do with, cause we want to look good. <laughs> we want to make money even. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And, and because of that, they, they do, they take that man centered view that somehow their actions are going to contribute to God's supreme sovereign decree and plan. And it's such a backwards way of looking at it, because just like you said, it immediately then goes to, okay, what kind of strategies can we yeah. use? Yeah. What are you talking about strategies? We don't need oh, strategies. Yes. Who are we dealing with? Are we dealing with a God that is actually yeah. sovereign, or are we dealing with a God who's incapable? And so he's like, come on, guys, strategies, exactly. bring them to the table. And it's, it's this backwards <sighs> idea. And something I want to touch on with you, too, because you were, you were going this direction, I really want to hit it on the head is a lot of churches have turned into a place that you bring the lost rather than a place for believers to be discipled to then go and preach to the lost. The church is not a hospital, like some people say, for the lost. Mm -hmm. A church Mm -hmm. is a body of believers that are being discipled and built up in the Lord. And so because of that issue, you also have a lot of churches, like you said, that are catering towards, okay, what kind of audio visual stuff can we use to appeal to the world? What kind of yes. uh, children's ministry can we have and youth groups can we have to bring them in and have them bring their secular friends and get more people? And you look at this, and again, it's all centers on that aspect. Is God sovereign yeah. or is he not? Is yeah. he sovereign or is he not? Exactly, and that's essentially the problem. Your, your theology informs your methodology. Right. And, 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 and that is something that people really don't grasp. What you think you you manifest it right in the church whatever you really think is true and when these people right um they disregard the authority of scripture um they have to rely on something else because it leaves a void so they go they go for these things and and they start changing the identity of the church because if, if you think about this for a second um when we share the sacraments it's it's for the believers right but how are you going to do that on elevation church Right. Most of them are not regenerated. Right. So, so, so they are forced because they know that's for the believer. You know, and some of them really are, are blasphemous and actually take the sacraments and, and they have no understanding of what they're doing. And so, so it creates a bigger problem. It starts slowly changing the identity of the church. And another aspect that it does is through worship. Um, and worship, right, um, their their criteria it's based on when it sounds good or it has a great solo i tell you this because i used to play guitar in these one of these churches and 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 we would sit down and and make the criteria on on what songs were going to be played and while we were picking songs we would literally be picking the most cool songs that we could play and it was all psychosomatic it was literally all about an emotional roller coaster and then you leave there and you go back empty, spiritually dead. I mean, dead as it can get. Right. And that, that's really a huge thing, too, because I, I can recall a time when I was serving on a worship team similarly. And <laughs> the, the, I, I'll keep the person nameless, but somebody who was on the leadership basically said, hey, for this song, I want to make the lights this color. I want to bring the room down because we want people to feel this way when we sing this song. I want to make sure that people respond this way. And then for the next song, I want you to bring the lights to this level and I want them to be this color so that we can invoke this emotion. And what you end up doing is you have a bunch of completely either brand new Christians or people who are not even regenerate that are coming over and over and over on Sunday to try to replicate an experience that they think is God. And so when that high dies during the week and things get back to normal living, they yeah. go to church not because they want to commune with God, but because they want to feel that high that the yeah. worship and the and the the moving sermon is giving them, and that's not yeah. true Christianity. That's just a watered no. down false gospel. Exactly, and and to to you know elaborate a little bit on that, pastors and I, I'm telling you, I've spoken to three pastors about this. I, I've I've you know uh, personally spoken to them about the error that they're making. Yeah. And I've seen pastors so focused on the visuals, so focused on leaving an imprint, but it's not with the gospel, if you know. If they're making an imprint on this person, but what they're doing essentially is that they're making people fall in love with them. 
mm. and not with the gospel. When you truly preach the gospel, right, you're going to have two reactions, Jonah. Either you're going to reject it or you're going to receive it. Right. And those that receive the gospel receive God. Yeah. So when you, so, so, see, they're afraid of letting people go. But the thing is, Jonah, that we have to understand that God is sovereign, yeah. that he chooses who he chooses. And, 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 and we cannot expect a gospel that is only cheerful. You have to hear the bad news that you're a sinner, yes. you know, and, and, and people don't want to preach that stuff. So they water down the gospel. And then they give you these visuals. I mean, Elevation Church, it's down the street from me. Oh, is it? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And these people use um, smells in their hallways. So um, people can be um, attracted to, to the environment. Mm -hmm. um, have you smelled a, a, a mall? Sure. It, it, has, it has a distinctive smell when you go to these um, uh, stores. Well, they do a similar thing. And, and he wants to wear the coolest clothes. I have nothing against that, right? But, but when we are talking about corporate worship, the number one person is God himself. Yes. yes. He, he is the center of our worship. He's the center of, the, of why we are gathering. So, so, so they have changed all the perspective and, and make it attractive to people that are not regenerated. Right. And when and when you go to a you know if you're a farmer, and you and you try to catch foxes, right? Because um, normally foxes will eat the the cattle, and it's good to hunt them for a while while the season is up, you know. And if you Jonah, if you get a fox and you take and you lock them up in a cage and you put him in the farm, you're not changing its nature. He's still a fox. If you let him go, he's gonna go out there and be a fox. And, and, and essentially what they're doing is they're doing, they're trying to do things that belong to God. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the regeneration is a monergistic work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And if, if they, if they don't understand these things, they are synergists. And this is why we are in the problem that we are. This is a theological banana peel. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think, I think too, another thing that a lot of these big churches fail to grasp um, and perhaps most tragically, is that in their pursuit of making it appealing, in their pursuit of all yeah. this, they're giving so many people a false hope. Yes, sir. This, this, this idea that they are regenerated Christians because they go to church and they feel the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Right? And yeah. that, that ultimately is what breaks my heart the most is you have these yeah. pastors. I like, I look at somebody like Stephen Furtick and I, I just get filled with anger <laughs> yeah. he can stand yeah. up and he can say what he says and he can do what he does and yeah. nothing. Yeah. There's not, yeah. it's just, it, it really blows my mind, man. It really does. Yeah. And, and another thing is that to, to, to keep in mind the severity of this matter um, as you know, uh, false gospels, spread like fire yeah i mean i mean i mean when american television first entered russia the first tv channels were tvn and all these false do doctrines i mean it is it is unbelievable and stephen Ferdick is is just one person that's in the spotlight right. but there are hundreds of churches i mean i i was part of this uh, conference called exponential conference and it's literally a whole bunch of churches that are just ex exploding to grow. If you call them churches, sure. but they're not churches right. because um, they've, they've, they don't have the identity of a church. I was sitting on one of these conferences with, with um, because these are strategists, uh, remind you. These yeah. are people that, re that really want to grow. So they, so they have a board and they're saying, well, how do we make our church from tier one to tier two yeah. and then to a level three church? And I mean, I'm blown away and they're giving all these ideas and, and, and I tell them, well, what about the gospel? If you really want to make a true disciple, right? Who better than the disciple maker? Yeah. And Jesus Christ himself, right. but they don't want to touch the gospel. Right. They don't, they, they, they hate the gospel and they reject it and they're suppressing it. And I have this gentleman, the, the guy telling me, well, we understand that the gospel is useful, but we need to at strategies. And I was like, did you really just say we need to add right. to it? 
Right. Um, and the, yeah, it's a broken theology, brother. And um, it's, it's sad. And this is why I do what I do. This is why I, I go on TikTok and put videos to create conscious and awareness to yeah. people. That, that there is a deep truth out there and we need to seek it, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, yeah. too, brother, when we, we <laughs> honestly, it's, it's harder for me to sometimes even fully wrap my head around that perspective because I praise the Lord that he's drawn yeah. me into a right, a right understanding of who he is yeah. and who I am. Um, but it blows my mind and, and I, I'm sorry if I'm dra- if I'm dragging eschatology into this a little bit, <laughs> You're but fine. it blows my mind that you can have a lot of these churches that believe in this pessimistic end times perspective yeah. and their theology is man centered. Yeah. And yet yeah. they think that I'm crazy yeah. for thinking that the sovereignty of God is is all that you need for the world to become Christian. Like exactly. it's just this, you're trying yeah. so hard through human efforts to accomplish something that God has declared will be accomplished simply yeah. by preaching the gospel. Oh yeah. Yeah. And on top of that, I mean, you, you, you I think you nailed it because I mean, if you have a wrong theology, I mean, when it comes to revelation, you're screwed because there's so much symbolism. That's a highway to get lost if you don't have the right parameters and you don't have the right understanding of scripture. If you don't have a good context of the book of Matthew, I mean, that's one of the things that blew my mind. That's how I became a post-millennial overnight. When I understood what Matthew, look, Matthew 24, uh, Jonah troubled me for a long time because I generally knew that it didn't make sense with any other word than post-millennialism. Yeah. You know, so, so these people with much love to them, because there, there's a lot of people that are saved, but there's a lot of people that are genuinely confused. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm a family man. You know, I have a wife, I have children, and, and we need to ask ourselves, do we want our, our children to grow under good doctrine? Yeah. That we must love truth. We must love truth. And I have people in these churches telling me, you know, talk about end times and everything. And I would simply say, well, what's your eschatology view? And they wouldn't even know what eschatology means. Right. So, so it's a hay way of getting lost. Once you have your bad theology, you're getting lost. Right. And yeah. that's, again, I go in straight back to the creeds and confessions. That's why they're so important. Yeah. Because yeah. It, it, it's not just a, a happy little ditty you sing. It's... It's a systematic yeah. theology, a lot of them. Yeah. You know, they go, it goes from yeah. start to finish and shows you this is what we believe, this is why yeah. we believe it, and this yeah. is why it's biblically true. And so, uh, man, yeah. when, you, when you showed me that, that little booklet, that you're, that's beautiful because right there, yeah. it's a foundation upon which yeah. the, and, and I, I'm, I'm going to kind of go off on a bunny trail here, but one of, one of my biggest concerns, and actually my brother, who I'm hopefully going to have on the show at some point, he's, he's wanting to go into youth ministry and basically reform youth ministry. Um, and and his, his real big passion and concern, and, and one of mine too, is we see so many kids growing yeah. up in the church. And as soon yeah. as they hit that age where maybe they go off to college or something, faith falls apart. And parents yeah. go, well, where did we go wrong? They were in the church. We sent them to youth group. What happened? Yeah. Well, yeah. it's clear what happened. There was no yeah. apologetic. And so yeah. when they went into a aggressively hostile yeah. world, yeah. And it came at them and said, this is stupid. This is stupid. This is stupid. They yeah. crumbled because they had no foundation. If we do exactly. not teach our kids why they believe what they believe and ground them in it, not just a head knowledge, but a, this is true because of this, 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 of course they're going to fall apart if that's not there. But if we can effectively do that, which is where the creeds, the confessions, the catechisms come in, then boom, they have a foundation, not just to hold them into orthodoxy, but also yeah. to read scripture, to understand scripture, and then to yeah. go out and defend scripture against a very aggressive, hostile world. Exactly. I mean, that's what Jesus said in the parable of the seeds. Yes. You know, he talks about different seeds. And then, I mean, there are, there's a seed that wasn't really deep into the ground. It wasn't really deep enough. So, so, it, faded, so, so it died. Right. And that's what happens to a lot of, of kids. And I'm, I personally, I was a, also a youth leader. Sure. Uh, yeah. You know, it, and, and that's, I've, I've witnessed it. I've, I've seen this happen. Yeah. 
Yeah. I've seen I've seen it where they go to college, and 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 they lose their faith. Yeah. And, and well, it, uh, to our eyes, right? Yeah. And and essentially, what it what it is, Jonah, also is that the parents did not minister their kids. Yeah. They didn't really evangelize their children. Yes. Think about it. Uh, we we are supposed to um, make our children grow in the ways of God, especially with covenant theology. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, our belief is that um, there's not going to be a day that my daughters don't know that they're Christians, Jonah. Yes. Um, the, I'm, I'm going to raise them in the Lord's way on their on increasing confessions because that's what God told us to do. Right. God told us to raise our children in the word of God. And yes, it's, it's so sad, brother. So yeah. sad. And I think, I think you're touching on something big there because I think one of the biggest breakdowns that a lot of these liberal churches have contributed to is the breakdown of responsibility of the headship of a husband and a father yep. and yep. The, the family structure as a whole. There's, there's a, a yep. lack of attention. Churches yep. are no longer family oriented and family centered. Yep. And because of that, again, that foundation is gone. And so you do have parents that go, what happened to my kid? It was mm -hmm. the job of the church and the youth group to teach them. <laughs> exactly. No, no, no. That's yep. not the job of the church. Mm -hmm. The church is there to come alongside you, but you are the one that is raising your child in the knowledge, yep. in the fear, and the admonition of the Lord, period. Yeah, yeah. If, if, if parents specifically, and I want to call out men here because it's so important, if we are not mm -hmm. taking that responsibility seriously, yeah. we're missing a huge calling in our lives, not just... Yeah not just on a superficial sense, but on a covenantal sense, you know, yes, to a yes. very, very large degree. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, I, I will encourage men that have children to, to evangelize to them. I really emphasize this because, I mean, there is great joy in there. Yes. I mean, when you see your child, and, and I, get, I, I get emotional when I talk about this because my daughter, you know, she embraced the gospel at six years old. Praise you God. know, um, because she understood she and, and the level of faith a child has. It's, it's, it's amazing to witness. Mm. It, so so we must plant seeds into our children. Yes. We must raise them in the Lord's way. And we need to understand something. Snakes are going to come to the yard. Yeah. OK, uh, we can't keep them out. It's our job to train our children, to prepare them, to train them. For when they're off on their own, right, uh, we've taught them what they needed to learn. And that's what happens to a lot of these kids that go to college and lose their faith. Uh, they don't have proper apologetics. They haven't been truly raised in the church. Uh, you, you've been, we've confused the name of church, right, with, with the place that we go and, and we gather. And, and that's really not it. We are the people. We are the church. Yeah. And, and and I think that we uh well we uh, I'm I'm speaking in present tense well those people right uh, I think they associate the physical place with with the church and that's not really it um there is a sense of which um it takes a village to raise a child but you need to raise your child right. you know you you need to raise him in the Lord's way and. You know, I think they lean too much on that aspect, yeah. And to a large degree, I would even, I would even say that the, the best way to describe the relationship of the congregational body of Christ to a family in terms of the assistance of raising the child is, is accountability. That, that, yeah. would, that would be the best way, I think. Is yeah. Your, your so job is to raise the child. The church is your accountability for that and your support Amen. in that. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I had something I was going to say. I don't want to. Oh, yes. Go, going off what you were saying, uh, Doug Wilson has something that he says that I just absolutely love. He said, the best way to sum up the entirety of Scripture is the, the, the entire narrative of Scripture is um, slay the dragon, get the girl. And yes. it's the idea that, you know, Adam's responsibility was to slay the dragon, get the girl. He failed in that. We have yeah. Christ that came. He succeeded, protected his bride, slayed the dragon. And now we, on a, like, again, a covenantal level, have that ability to reflect that through our marriages, through our fathering, our children, um, yeah. and, and reflecting that to the world around us. And so, like Amen. you said, when we are slaying those dragons, when we yeah. are demonstrating that and reflecting Christ to our families, 
yeah. that that is going to lead yes. to their firm yeah. when they go to do that as well. Yes, and and what happens is Jonah that um, there's a and I tell you this happens on these churches. There's a misconception of what living for God really is. And and I used to and I used to work for a church like Elevation, and I had so many responsibilities in there, and it felt like I was working working and and there was something in me that told me well i'm just doing I, i'm doing something right but i'm just trying to earn my way up mm. and it, so so essentially this is what it comes about and when you read the first question and in, and in, in, in the confessions of faith what is the purpose of life to glorify god and enjoy him forever yes. and he has prepared us for every good work so you feeding your children you loving your wife like god loved the church you witnessing to your neighbors, that's the works that God prepared you for. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these people confuse it with an actual work in the church, right? Mm -hmm. and, they, and they want to perform and they want to do these things. And the reality is you need to change your life. You need to be regenerated. Right. You need to reflect Christ everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we go back to the organic way of the church growth. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Peter, also another example, is when he resuscitated the lady in Acts chapter 9, okay? Not only did he lift her up, but he, everybody rejoiced around her, everybody that was mourning for her, you know? And, and, and that's how the church grew. You know, um, when I joined the Presbyterian church, Jonah, um, and I joined the church, and I was the only Hispanic because it's, it's a cultural shock because um, I've always grew up picking churches that are Hispanic, and, and I always had a different criteria. When I joined the Presbyterian Church, these people showed me the love of Christ. These people ministered to my family. I mean, from simple dinners, you know, from being there for every situation that I needed to, um, by preaching the Word of God, helping me worship in corporate worship. Mm. Um, you know, th there is something about the church the power of the gospel. And that's where we need to put our trust in, right. the power of Christ. And, and that's what happens. They, going back to the churches, where, is, where do they rely? They yeah. rely in ideas. They rely in psychology. They rely in many other things, which are helpful, by the way, but they are not part of the church. That's right. not the way God moves. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, that's spot on. And I think too, when we look at the, the church, um, I think a lot of people have the tendency to think specifically of Protestants that they have a low view of church um, because of the idea of the whole break between the Catholic and the Protestant yeah. church. Protestants have some of the highest view of the church and, you know, Martin Luther and a lot of those Protestants, they considered themselves the Catholic church, right? We are the Catholic yeah. church. We are the ones yep. who went back to the roots of, yeah. of, of what the church believed yeah. because Rome went astray. And so yeah. it's not a low view of the church. It's an extremely high yeah. view of the church. And it's a high view of the church that yeah. bases its theology solely in the word of God. And that's yes. the standard by which we measure what the true church yeah. is right yeah and essentially also like if you think about it they uh, sometimes people uh get a deistic view of the world mm. they just think that we're just that god created everything and we're just here you know by our own means doing whatever and we need to understand that god is in control of everything i mean if we really believe in the sovereignty of christ and especially for the post-millennial view you know god is in control of everything Right. You know, and, and sometimes that's what we tend to confuse. Uh, sometimes we think that we can help and we can add ourselves to the equation. And that's just a massive error. Massive. Yeah, I, and I'll tell you, man, when I, when I actually sit down <laughs> and contemplate the sovereignty of God, yeah, it, it, it literally brings me to my knees and brings just trembling to my yeah. limbs and tears to yeah. my eyes because yeah. I, I don't think people grasp God does not need us. God does not need us. Mm -hmm. And yet here I am talking with you. And you yeah. and me are both Christians in right relationship yeah. with God. All because yeah. God sovereignly decreed that he wanted us to partake in bringing him glory. Amen. 
that humbles me to the absolute oh yes yes. fullest extent of the word and and you know just to touch on that just so because i i I contemplate this jonah i really do because it, it, it surprises me that one of my friends one of my best friends is in california he's on the opposite side of the coast Sure. And and we have such a strong bond, you know. Um, and and, and it's Christ yes. that has brought us together. It, see, we're not we're we are not uh, saving people. Jesus is saving people. Right. You know, just just like the Book of Acts is the acts of Jesus Christ through the apostles. Right. And so so God is bringing together His people. I I know a guy. You 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 talked to him earlier, Joshua. Yes. Um. Oh, such a such a lovely kid. Oh he traveled God. last Sunday an hour, okay, and in bus just to go to a reformed church. Wow. And 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 that is Jonah, that's what God is doing in America right now. Yes. He's closing the churches that need to be closed and he's reinforcing the ones that need to be reinforced. Right. And and just like me and you are talking right now from different states, God is doing this with many people. I've talked to many reformed kids, 17 to 40 years old, yep. reform, recently embracing theology. I mean, there's some kids, Jonah, that love God and, are, and, and they love the truth. Yes. And they want to love and worship God as he truly is. They don't want a, a figment of their imagination like most people do. They want to embrace it, one triune God. And, and that is amazing to see right now. It is. It really is. And, and that's, that's one thing that I, I want people to be so encouraged by is when, yeah. you, when you come to terms with the sovereignty of God. And, and don't get me wrong, that's tough to do. When I yeah. went from an Arminian type mm-hmm. perspective to a Calvinist perspective, I spent nights weeping yeah. <laughs> over just yes, how sir. little control I had and, yeah. and recognizing what that means for me. <laughs> in yeah. the yeah. It's tough. It is a tough thing. But yeah. the fruit of that is recognizing, I, I can't believe some of the arguments. If you're a Calvinist and God hasn't elect people, why are you even evangelizing? I cannot even believe the sheer misunderstanding oh, of that. I'm evangelizing, yeah. number one, because God said to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but, but number two, <laughs> because I don't know who that is, and I have full confidence that my evangelism is not in vain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I contributed if i was going out trying to save people nobody would be saved but if i'm going out preaching the gospel as a vessel by which god is administrating his sovereignty praise the lord that's that takes the pressure off of me to feel like i have to do something and it also places the emphasis on a sovereign god who is bringing his people in gathering the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other and Christ reigning supreme over it all. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, and people struggle when they start, um, you know, understanding these truths. Um, but the Bible says that there's a sorrow um, which brings salvation. There is a good sorrow. And I remember um, uh, when I started struggling with these truths as well, you know, um, because it, it deconstructs uh, a false view that we had. Yeah. Uh, so, so we need to first recognize and then embrace the truth of Scripture. Um, and and also another thing that happens is the more the more you learn, uh, the more holes are you going to see. So that's that's the bad news for the Calvinists. Uh, right. Our 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 life uh, in our life as Christians, we're going to grow in God's knowledge, and then we're going to learn how merciful He is and how boundless His mercy is. And then we're going to see our sin. And, and that causes something in us yes. to recognize uh, ourself. Um, like John Calvin said in the Institutes, uh, first, you, there's two knowledges that are really important for us. And that's the knowledge of God mm-hmm. and then also the knowledge of ourselves. Yes. So, and, and, and about evangelizing, it blows my mind too. It really does. Because if people will understand historically that John Calvin was heavily involved in evangelism, and the same thing with post-millennialism, you know, um, when um, uh, David Brainer died in the, uh, with, you know, next to Jonathan Edwards, and he gave him permission to publish his biography. I mean, that changed Jonathan Edwards' eschatology and the way he evangelized. And so too many other people in Africa, in China, in the United States. 
So, so when people talk about these views, um, I think that what we need to, what they need to do, is um, try to give us a fair on the, a fair chance on, on these topics, and and not being too hostile as some people are, and and just just sit down and have a, a dialogue like we're having right now. I mean, back in the day, you know, uh, going back to the Christian Confessions, how do you think those were developed? Right. Um, I mean, at first we run from from diver, we run from uh, diver. Well, we run from controversy. Sure. We run from controversy, which back in the day when there was a controversy, they would ecumenically gather. Yes. And the greatest thoughts were developed. Right. You know. Right. And, and so, so we're doing the opposite now. We don't want controversy. And and what happens is when two worldviews clashes, we we're gonna start waving out, you know, comparing it to scripture, and we're gonna see uh, where the truth is. Right, that's exactly right, and and I think I think too, um, and I I'm bringing this up because I think that it, it deserves as much emph- emphasis as it can possibly get. But I think yeah. one of the main reasons that say post millennial eschatology is misunderstood is because yeah. a lot of people approach eschatology, eschatology without the foundation of God's sovereignty. And yeah. so I think that that kind of idea for a lot of people is that's very far-fetched. The world, yeah. have you looked out your window? And yeah. what, what that tells me is it's a low view of, of God's sovereignty, right? Because yeah. there's an emphasis yeah. on what I see with my eyes going on in the world cannot yeah. be changed by what I can do. Therefore, it yeah. won't change. Well, of course, it yeah. won't be changed by what you can do, but that's not what we're talking about, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah. again, I just, I want to emphasize when God's sovereignty is the center of yeah. everything, yeah. that flows into your eschatology, that flows into your soteriology, that flows yeah. into the way the church functions, that, fo- yeah. that flows into the way the creeds and confessions are written, and that yeah. flows into the very foundation upon which all theology, that is orthodox theology, is built. Yeah. Exactly. And, and that's what happens a lot, too. And another thing that we need to also emphasize is theology proper. We yeah. need to study the Father. And, and when you put those together, the sovereignty and, and of God and, and the study of the Father, I think it reconstructs, it, it, it rewires your brain, theologically speaking, yeah. um, to a bigger understanding. When I, when I embrace post-millennial eschatology, um, I see it almost in every page in the New Testament. Me too. Because, because you can, what you see, you cannot unsee. Right. Um, and so that's, that's something that I've experienced. So now, now I see the kingdom of God, right? Like a mustard seed growing, yes. right? If you look at the year 150, historically speaking, the church was active. The church was moving, right? But there wasn't as much growth. And look at the, the end result that we have now. Right. You know, um, Christianity is definitely growing. Um, and also God said that the kingdom of God was like a clump of dough, yeah. you know, that expands. Um, it, it also says it's like a rock that fell from the mountain. And, and so, so we need to understand that God is in control. He's sovereign and he's gathering his people. He's building himself a, a, a nation. Right. And, and, and sometimes we read, sometimes we read the new Testament and we don't see this mm-hmm. and it's right there. It's right there. It is. And that's, that's what I tell a lot of people. I, 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 I like to say, what you're looking for to be fulfilled at the second coming of Christ, he accomplished at his first coming. Yes. And you're yeah. looking towards something that's already there. It's already yeah. there if you would just, yeah. just see it. And, and I think the, the beauty of post-millennial eschatology and the reason that I am just so passionate about it and sharing it and making sure that it's not misrepresented is yeah. that to me... It, it, it places a foundation upon which we can truly joyfully prepare for the future, yes. knowing the sovereign plan of God. Not that if the world was declared to be doomed, that God wouldn't be sovereign and we couldn't find joy in that. But yeah. to see the, again, covenant theology, I think if you study covenant theology, post-millennialism becomes a very, very clear part of that, right? Yeah. You know, covenant yeah. works, Adam failed, then Christ fulfills it. And yes. The reversal of the curve, it just, it all points to this idea of this kingdom growing and building and expanding and getting back to what we were talking about right from the beginning. This is why you as a father can joyfully share with your children these creeds, confessions, catechisms, and clean them up is because 
you you see the big picture. You know what God's doing. Yeah. You know that what you yeah. do right now affects what they're going to do with their children and their children and their children yeah. for generations to come. It's a generational yeah. way of thinking. Um, yeah. That's not limited to, oh, I should probably quit my job because the end is right now. And then yeah. how are you living intentionally for the gospel at that point? You're not. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it, it yeah. Puts in perspective, this idea of why the creeds, like, think about this. And I'm sure you've thought about this. I'm more speaking to whoever's listening. <laughs> I know. The, the fathers, that when they wrote these creeds and these confessions, they didn't write them so that they could look at them and then once they died, they'd be over. They wrote them thinking generationally. <laughs> they yes, wrote sir. them for the coming generations to have a foundation yeah. with which to hold them in line with Scripture. And so exactly. we need to look back and we need to realize, I'm, I'm reciting this catechism. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm speaking this confession and agreeing with it. Yeah, because of these fathers back then that passed it to thee and, and them and them and them and I get to ingrain that in my children, raise them in the yeah. mountain Lord so they can continue this down, and that's how Christianity yeah. is rooted in Scripture. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly, exactly, and that's what happens, man. Um, you know, when I was in this Wesleyan church, um, they, uh, all they would talk about is John Wesley, John Wesley, John Wesley, and though I do love some of the literature from John Wesley. Uh, you know, they were boxed in and they, and what they missed out Jonah is the whole context of the church. You know, what has the church said? If we really think that God is gathering his people throughout the centuries and he has given his divine revelation to us, right. For all generations to, to have, right. Why are we not putting in context? What has the church said? And, the, and, and when I started digging down onto this and pressing on this issue, that's how I became confession. Because if you, if you say you're a Christian, right, um, you obviously listen to your, to, to your brethren, right. you know, and, and these are brethren. You know, God has sprinkled great minds throughout centuries, right? And, and if we really believe that, it is our job to to investigate these things and, 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 and to dive into these things and obviously keep scripture as our standard, right? Um, but but this, is, this is key for, for our growth in, in, in God's word. Absolutely. And I think yeah. what, we, what we also need to look at that is very important is the, the creeds and confessions that we have have stood the test of time. Yes, sir. You yeah. look at a place like Elevation, Elevation is yeah. not going to stand the test of time. Churches <laughs> that are built yeah. on a, a faulty foundation that are yeah. centered around what's going on in the immediate culture, those are the churches that are going to falter. <laughs> those yeah. are the churches yeah. that are eventually going to crumble and fall and be buried in rubble yeah. and forgotten, right? Yeah. yeah. Why, why is it that these creeds, these confessions have survived yeah. the test of time? It's because they're based on the word of God and upholding yes. the sovereignty of God. And that stands yeah. the test of time, right? That stands yes. the test of time because it's not centered yeah. around, okay, what's going on in our culture? Let's form yeah. something that goes with that. Let's find strategies that can pull in and are culturally yeah. relevant. No, that was not what they were concerned about. They were concerned, exactly. about what does scripture say? Yeah. How can we be accurate to it for the coming generations? And yeah. that point is what's going to survive. Yeah. The very second coming of Christ himself. Exactly. And when we don't preach these truths, Jonah, what happens is that uh, we, we're not giving people uh, the truth of God. And when we read the book of Acts, you know, uh, that the apostles uh, were put in jail and the Pharisees are having a conversation. They say, one of them says, well, if this is God, okay, there's, you don't want to find yourself fighting against it. Okay. Right. And, 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 and that brings us to essential truth. The truth prevails. Mm -hmm. The truth stands uh, still. I like this old hymn called the old 100. Mm -hmm. And it says that God's tru uh, truth stands firmly throughout the ages, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so, and you, you, you nailed it right there. Um, you know, churches that are not founded in the truth are, are their destiny is to be in the ground is to fall down and hard, you know, and they're going to fall in a theological pit. And the problem is that you don't want to fall in a pit pit. Yeah. You don't want to fall in a, on a, on a hole so deep that you can't get yourself out of. 
And so when you, we bring these things into our attention, um, we notice that um, this is a serious matter, a very serious matter. Right, yeah. I, what comes to mind is in uh, Paul, one of Paul's letters to Timothy, he talks about the last days and what the last days are going to bring. And obviously the context there is the last days of the old covenant uh, era, but the application still stands true today. At the very end of that passage, and I, I love it because a lot of premillennials will use this to talk about how bad things are going to get, but I'm like, read the, the final portion. He says, J just as in Moses' day, Janice and John Brees opposed Moses, so too these men will oppose all things, but yeah. their folly will be made known to all and they shall progress no further. Yeah. And I think this applies to churches that teach a false gospel because they are no yeah. different than the lost world. And eventually yeah. their folly will be made known to all and they will progress no further. And we can look back in history and we yeah. can see this. The true yeah. church has been kept, preserved by God, a remnant of the church throughout history. And yeah. all these false heresies, all of these came collapsing down and it was made known. Yeah. To them. And so again, this is that post colonial yeah. eschatology. This is that yeah. sovereign God. It's the recognition that there is something yeah. being out in history that is not yeah. made by human hands, is not controlled by human hands, is not brought about by human hands, is simply brought yeah. about by a sovereign God who has decreed it to be so. As Isaiah 9 says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. Amen. Amen. And that's something so important. And, you know, what happens is, Jonah, you know, um, these people read, there's, I've gotten really close to a lot of uh, these folks that, that, you know, don't preach the gospel, you know, um, and some of them generally believe they're doing the right thing, yeah. you know, um, some of them, you can see um, that it's obvious that they're suppressing the truth, they're hostile, um, they're anti-intellectual, um, they're, they're not at peace with themselves, but at the end of the day, the, the higher truth is that either you are a true preacher or you're a false preacher. Right. Um, and, and we cannot, um, there's no middle ground there. Right. You know, and, and, and so we need to make a decision, right? And we need to make a decision and, and, and be, decide where we want to be uh, for the rest of our living days here. Yes. That's why I chose to be a Presbyterian, brother. <laughs> yeah, man, and I, I got to tell you, I was having a conversation with a few uh, brothers who I'll keep them unnamed <laughs> for now, but yeah. <laughs> I was telling them, we were all talking and I'm like, dude, I think I'm a closet Presbyterian. <laughs> <And> yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, when I compare Presbyterian church with yeah. Reformed Baptist, I'm like, oh my goodness. That's, and yeah. even the infant baptism, man, I'm going to tell you, yeah. covenantally, yeah. that makes, it makes so much sense. Crystal clear. It sure does. It and sure does. It, it's, it's, it's almost to me unbelievable that the Baptists haven't caught on to just how biblical that actually is. <laughs> exactly. And, and you know what's unbelievable? A lot of denominations outside the Presbyterian Church do what is called a child presentation. Yes. And they, they and the ceremonial. My parents did it for me. Yeah. Child. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the ceremony, it's 99.9% .9 the same. The only thing they forgot is to add water to the baby. <laughs> so, so when they are, when we understand the signs and yeah. we understand, uh, you know, what are the signs of the covenant? Uh, it changes our perspective. It really does. Yeah. yeah. Praise God, man. Well, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I will, I will not be surprised if when I get out of school and start looking to settle down somewhere permanently, cause I'm in an apartment right now. Me and my wife still are looking for a house to settle in permanently. You will right not on. be surprised to see me become a Presbyterian. I'll just tell you that right now. Well, I tell you this much. There's a lot of uh, Presbyterians in the closet right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Very true. Well, uh, I want to I want to start to wind things down and, and get, yeah. get things to kind of pull back for an application. So when mm -hmm. talking about this, I think we've covered a lot right now. And it's been sure have. a blessing, man. This has been so edifying for me. Likewise. Um, I want to I want to kind of close with giving an application for people watching because I know a lot of my subscriber yeah. base is reformed, but I know there's also some people who are newer Christians who yeah. are intrigued, but a lot of them are probably in a lot of these churches like that. Um, and and yeah. maybe you've never even heard of creeds, confessions, all that. Yeah. So if you could just leave them with one thing, what, what would that be? I would say, um, 
that we need to be really honest with ourselves. Uh, I think that we need to start seeing, uh, leaving our presuppositions to the side and ask God to literally remove those theological cobwebs that we may have. Um, you know, and, and only the Holy Spirit will do that. So I will encourage my viewers to, um, to seek God with all their heart, soul, and mind. Um, I really do. Because before I was reformed, Jonah, before I embraced Calvinism, I experienced regeneration. I experienced conversion. And, and, and most of my growth happened prior to that. I mean, right on, right on regeneration. So I have a deep love for my brothers that are not reformed. Um, but I, I would just implore you and I would, I, I would encourage you to pray about these truths that we've spoken of. Um, th these truths that are so important for the Christian faith. And really uh, to try to understand, um, you know, our, 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 my reformed brothers. Uh, that's really what I will leave today. Beautiful. Well, man, I'm going to just close us in prayer. Uh, again, Amen. thank you so much for being on. And people who are listening right now or watching right now, I'm going to have Hector's information to find Theology Spoon, his TikTok and his Instagram. So you guys can go follow, be encouraged. I'm, I'm always encouraged. I love the videos. Some of them are some hardcore serious videos. Other yeah. have a little bit of comedy mixed in there, make me laugh. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's tough, it's theologically grounded and sure. So Brother, thank you for being on. Let's, let's close. Oh. Right there. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we humbly come before you. I just want to praise you for your sovereignty, Lord. I want to praise you and thank you for who you are. And God, the sole purpose of us is to know you and enjoy you forever. And God, I, I'm so thankful that by your sovereign choice, your sovereign election, Lord, that you have included me in that pursuit of enjoying you. You need to. <laughs> I don't understand why, but I know that it's true, and I can simply just fall to my knees and say thank you. So, Lord, as we, as we end this podcast, God, I just thank you for my brother, Hector. I thank you for his zeal for you. And God, I just also want to thank you for all the church fathers throughout history that have thought generationally, have put together these creeds, these confessions that help us to stay rooted and grounded in your holy word. Lord, I pray that those listening would be encouraged, would be edified by this, and that you would maybe draw some into understanding you in a new way that they never have before, Lord. I know at first when I started to become reformed God it was overwhelming and it was scary because seeing how big you actually are is is a scary thing but after I settled Lord it brought me supreme comfort and daily it brings me supreme comfort and peace so let that be true of the listeners let that be true of me and Hector as we continue to revel in your holiness and in your grandeur we thank you for the cross we thank you for Christ, for reconciling us to you. And we thank you for the opportunity to gather as a church, as a body, as believers, to magnify your name. In your precious holy name, Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen. Amen.